Thank you. I think that's what you call a hospital pass. <laughs> Außerdem bin ich eigentlich aus dem 17. Bezirk. But, thanks. But it sounds a lot better and uh, a lot more important when um, I say I'm from New Zealand and I actually did come all the way here from Auckland. I've been living in New Zealand for the last 12 years and I'm super happy to uh, be here at a conference for the first time ever. But what I do want to talk to you about today is self-selection or self-selecting teams. And I just want to do a quick check. How many of you have heard of self-selection? A few. Excellent. How many of you have tried it? Great work. For those who haven't tried it or haven't heard of it, it's a way for people to pick their own team. Basically, in an organisation where everyone gets to decide which team they want to work on. And it's based on the idea that people do their best work if they can choose who they work with and what they work on. And I just want to have you think for a moment. If I were to walk into your organisation and ask you, a week from now, we're going to do this. Everyone is going to down their tools and we'll ask them, ask them to form teams and to choose themselves which team they want to be in. Do you think it'd be smooth sailing? <laughs> or do you think it'd be people being driven by their egos and descent into chaos? Who thinks it would work? Oh, Jesus. OK, I promise you, by the end of this talk, at least 80% of you are going to raise their hands when I ask you the question again. Because I want to share with you the concepts and ideas behind self-selection and how to do it against the backdrop of a case study, the case study of a New Zealand company where we did the first self-selection at scale ever. 2013, and uh, it's a company of 500 people, three locations, and the biggest event was uh, 100 people at the same time in the same room. And it worked very well. The context we're in, where, um, we definitely had more traffic lights than Beata. This was basically our project landscape. We had projects that were stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. And the reason for that was that we were organized in the matrix maze that Phil was, has been talking about. We built something, and then marketing didn't have time. Or we developed something and didn't have any testers. So basically, there was a number of people waiting for each other all the time and we knew something had to happen. And we had heard about the goodness of Agile, and we have heard about the amazingness of teams, and um, what we wanted was an organization where everyone would work in small, cross-functional teams. And we know for a fact that teams work best. There's research that shows that dedicated teams are 60% more productive than the kind of teams, teams where people are 10% here and 20% there and 50% over there. And we also know from research that team design accounts for about 60% of performance variability. We know that from research. So we know this is really, really good, and this is really important to get right. And because it's so important, who chooses? Management. So we believe that as managers, because this is so important, we need to make this decision. We know best who should work with whom. But really, it does work, actually, up to a certain degree. We are good people. We want the best for the people who report to us. We also know them quite well. So we know which direction people want to go in. We know what they're good at. And we also know very often who they like and how they like to work. But if you're more than 10, 15 people and other people who report to different managers now get into the mix, it doesn't scale very well because it gets really, really complex. And I remember being part of moving people around on pieces of paper. 
trying to figure out how to put people into the best possible teams, only to publish it and go, oh, George really wants to go in a different direction two years from now, and Peter over here, he hates Mary, so this is not a good combination either. Back to the drawing board. So what we realized was, this is really hard, and we're probably going to get it wrong. And why are we making this decision? Shouldn't it be the people who are affected who make this decision? Shouldn't this decision be, be made at the level where most of the information actually is? Shouldn't people just decide who goes on which team? And isn't it all in the agile spirit that if we treat people as responsible adults, they will behave like responsible agile adults? So we thought the thing to do is to let people decide, to put this problem to the people who are affected and say, help us, who should be in which team? And then we thought, surely someone must have done this before. So like any average intelligent person does, we go and Google. And I don't know if you've ever seen an empty research page, results page. It turns out nobody had done this before, or if they had, they hadn't published anything about it. So we knew we were on our own. And the thing is, if there's something where you can't find any information that nobody seems to have done before, you're either a genius, and everyone has overlooked it, or you're just batshit insane, and it's a really dumb idea. <laughs> and we honestly didn't know which one it was. What we did know was it's the right thing to do. Yes, we did feel fear, but we also felt excitement of having people decide for themselves what needed to be done. So this is my friend David Moore and me looking out in the harbour in Auckland and, um, with a blank piece of paper in front of us, trying to design a process for self-selection. And this is what we came up with. We, of course, talked to people before the event but during the event, the first thing we'd do, we'd reiterate why we're doing self-selection. That we're asking people to help us solve a problem. And we'd then have product owners talk to people, basically pitching their, their teams or their squads, explaining, hey, this is my squad, this is the purpose of this squad, and work would be roughly like this. For example, we had a buyer squad, and you're going to support people who are buying things on our site. We then have iterations, 10 minutes at the time. Uh, experience had shown us that uh, longer actually doesn't make any sense and you don't get additional value. But 10 minutes at a time, people take a photo, put themselves into the team or squad they want to work in. And then after 10 minutes, people report back, you look around, who is missing what, or does any team have too many of something? And then you do that as many times as needed until there are teams. And then, in the end, you walk out with a number of blueprints for teams that you can then kick off. So the first thing we needed to do was actually define what teams we needed. And that's quite a difficult task took us ages. And what's really important to us was that we could define teams that were customer-facing, that had a purpose and could stay together as a stable team. For example, this team, the buyer squad, made sure that it was easy for people on our e-commerce site to buy something. The fashion squad was in charge of selling fashion on the site. So the idea was that it was people who wanted to work together and also people who wanted to achieve a particular customer outcome. And apart from defining squads, those are empty squad sheets for the day, we also pre-selected the product owner. And the reason we did that was that TradeMe has um, areas such as property or motors or general marketplace. And very often people who know a lot about car selling know very little about property and vice versa. In a future self-selection, what I'd love to do is 
have uh, product owners not pre-selected, and also maybe put it up to people to, be, to define what teams are actually needed. Apart from, um, sorry, apart from the squads, we also defined constraints. We wanted to have as few constraints as possible to make this a true self-selection. And we only had three. Team needs to be able to deliver end-to-end, -end, something that provides value to customers. We didn't want to have huge teams, so it max seven people. And we also needed to have them co-located. And the reason we said that is that we're in three cities, and we wanted to have full teams in each city, and not something like the marketing person in Wellington and the BA in Auckland and the tester in Wellington. So with that, we went into self-selection day. And still, because it was so unproven, it was a huge leap of faith. Because trade me, in New Zealand, we're the equivalent of eBay. And it's also responsible for 65% of the national internet traffic. So if you bring that down that site, you're on the front page of the paper. But still, we knew we needed and wanted to do this. So the big day came, and um, our room looked something like this. We had empty squat sheets where people could put their photos. We made sure they weren't too close to each other because we physically wanted people to move to the squats they wanted to be in. And then we welcomed everyone with a photo when they came to self-selection day. The entire event we did against the backdrop of uh, a big sign, do what's best for Trade Me. And that was to remind people that while we care about you and we want to make sure that you do what you want to do, the main reason for doing this is that we want to do what's best for the company and instead of us deciding, we trust you to make a good decision. So what we did next was uh, after the product owner pitches in front of um, the backdrop of do what's best for Trade Me, we put a timer on the wall and we shouted, go. And then this happens, <laughs> which is nothing. People just stand around. It's kind of awkward. Nobody does anything. And it's really important as a facilitator to not to panic at this stage. Because the next thing that usually happens, and it always takes about two or three minutes, is that people actually start moving. People start putting their photos where they want to go, the squats they want to work in, and there's actually some movement that starts. After 10 minutes, it turns a bit into the Eurovision Song Contest, where uh, you stop and you go, hey, I'm Matt from the Bio Squat. We have uh, too many testers, no marketing person, and uh, not enough developers. So every squat goes like that. You surface all this information, and with the new information, you can start a new self-selection round. Usually, it takes about three rounds. First one, disaster. I've seen squats with seven testers. Second one, there's a bit of movement. In the third one, people actually get the hang of it when they start negotiating, when they start figuring out what if we did this, what if we did that, how would it look like? But at some point, you actually got to stop, either because you have solved it, but if you do self-selection scale, at scale, it's not going to happen. Because if you have 150 people in the room and you want to have 16 or 17 squads, there's no way you just happen to have the right people with the right skills to go into squads. So when you look around and you see this happening, people looking at their mobiles, people zooming out, talking about the weather, not, not much moving going on, it's time to, spot, to stop. We had 11 out of 16 squads and said, cool, the 11 of you can go. We're going to work with the rest of the remaining people. Took everything off and it's had a had another self-selection, a smaller scale, with just 20 people to solve the last number of squads. The important thing here is to make sure that people realise that the people who are not in the squads that have the check and are done, 
Those are not the Muppets nobody wants to work with. This is just because the numbers can't actually match. And then we managed to get 15 out of 16 full squads. And the last one, we knew we needed to hire people. And that's when we introduced imaginary friends. <laughs> hire cards. They needed a tester and a senior designer. And in the spirit of self-selection, we allowed that squad to hire the last two people. So looking back, what did we learn? We've done this in many, many countries now. And uh, we've done it many times all over the world. And there's one thing that stands out, and that is that it's all about relationships. So we ask people why they choose how they choose. And then they say, well, to do what's right for the company. I chose based on the area I wanted to work in. I think that's rubbish, because it's totally not what we see during those events. People want to be where the, pe the other people are they want to work with. We see that when someone can't make the day and they can nominate a proxy, they have got one instruction. Wherever, wherever you go, take me with you. So it's all about relationship, and even people who don't want to work with each other, who move away when someone joins the squad that they don't want to work with. And you know what? It's actually OK. It's no drama. It's fine not to want to work with every single person in your company. And the other thing that happens is that everyone in every country has roughly those questions. Any of you thinking of those? Yes. So let me quickly see if I can answer some of them. People arguing and bitching. Actually, it doesn't happen because people are responsible adults. It doesn't mean we don't have hard conversations. It doesn't mean that people don't compromise. They do, but they negotiate like, like adults. And there is no childish kindergarten fight anywhere. Is some poor person not going to be picked? This is not a system of picking. It is active. You have your photo. You put yourself where you want to be. And for people who are completely new or don't know what to do, there's even a squad, which is called, I have no squad. Help, please approach me. Persuading management. It's actually not that hard. Best case? You got an organization with teams full of people who are happy or at least know why they're in the squad they're in and have chosen to compromise. You don't have anyone whinging about why they're in the team they're in. And worst case, if it doesn't work, there's always plan B to do it the way you've done it before. Then you decide if it doesn't work. And you also know people won't create the perfect squads. Neither will we as management. How do you deal with people's fears? Because more and more often, people ask us, can we come to their organizations and run self-selection for them? And then people actually are fearful. Am I going to sign away my life? What if I end up in a squat that I, didn't like, that I don't like? What if... Um, Nobody wants me. And to them, we say, we actually built this up. We don't just rock up and start. We have all company presentations. We have small group presentations with one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we guide people through a process where they realize it's actually a privilege to be allowed to do this. Can you add constraints? Every single time, there is, ooh, can you maybe have uh, a junior and a senior, and uh, can we have this particular mix? And I'd say, don't, because it just introduces complexity, and it moves you further and further away from self-selection. And aren't there some areas that are really unpopular and that you don't like? There probably will be. But one, I bet they're different from the ones that you think they are, just because I don't like this doesn't mean other people don't like it. And also, wouldn't you rather know? So now, six years later, we're still doing self-selection. People 
are getting happier, they love self-selection, they're more productive, and overall, it is a huge success. People are joining the company because they do, they have heard that they can be part of a company where they choose their own team. And because it attracts people and we want to be fair to them, we make sure that we run self-selection every six months, which is not actually disruptive, but it's a check. Do we have the right teams? Most people stay in the teams they're in, and everyone gets a chance to choose which team they do want to be in. So I just want to say that, really, we have tried it. If we do treat people like responsible adults, they do act like them. And our goal is to spread this as much as we possibly can. This is what it looks like when you get your book delivered in print. We want to spread this as much as we possibly can, so that ultimately, nobody is asking us to present, but it will be a bigger and bigger part of how people get into teams, and that in a couple of years from now, nobody is going to invite me to do any presentations about this anymore, because it's completely normal. Thank you.